Stop it. Okay, so picking up with where we left off before a little interruption on, um, when was it? Thursday? What's today? Today's Thursday. Tuesday. Shakespeare's sonnets. And I had to grab out of my office an earlier edition of the book because I left at 6.30 this morning and left my class text at home. Um, but I know I wanted to pick up with, we done sonnet 73, and as much as I'd rather like to do some of these others, I really can't. Because uh, we're going to try to do some of the Johnson, if not all of the Johnson stuff today. Can I have your attention up here? Thank you. Um, so let's pick up with... Uh, should we do 106? Um, let's start with Sonnet 116. And then we might come back after we move on. We might come back to 106. But Sonnet 116... And I told you the other day, because I thought I had this in my office, and I didn't, that I would bring in this edition. This is, I think, it's probably the best edition there is, Shakespeare Sonnets. Shakespeare Sonnets edited with an analytic commentary by Stephen Booth. This, hopefully, that is showing up. This is the dedicatory epistle, okay, to... The sonnets, to the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets, Mr. W.H., all happiness, blah, 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 okay? So, to show you what it looks like in the original, thirteen, sonnet 116. Notice, by the way, there's a perfect example of somebody not mining his proverbial P's and Q's. Because look at the number. Uh -huh. <laughs> Got it upside down. <laughs> Should be 160. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark, whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ nor no man ever lived. Okay, just look you know, for a couple of minutes at, at how this appears on the page. And by the way, if you're curious, marker, if you go through the library's research gateway and go to EEBO, Early English Books Online, pretty much everything from 1485 14, yeah, about 1485, 1485 forward that we do in this class, you can access facsimiles through Early English Books Online. In fact, you can access it, and if you want to be really nerdy English majory, you can download it, you can put it on your computer, etc., and you can use it to cite in papers. Uh, when I used to do a 17th century course, one of the semesters I did that, that there was no required textbook. We just use the Early English Book Online for everything. So, notice, love, and then Lou's. Who's Lou? Well, it's love, obviously. But why is the E off? I, the apostrophe is not indicating the elision of the E. Because nobody would say love is. Okay, if you had the apostrophe I-S after. It's just an example of the fluidity of language at the time, that there's really not a standardized form. In fact, you'll see there are other words sometimes spelled differently within the same poem. So, 
Let me not, to the marriage of true minds, admit impediments. Here you have modern version. Okay. Spellings, you know, some of the spellings changed a little. Like loves. Let me not, to the marriage of true minds, admit impediments. And it finishes there. The idea, the sentence ends there. Okay? That's an allusion to the English marriage ceremony. Okay? Where, in Shakespeare's day, you had what are called the bands. Okay? B-A-N-N-S. And the bands is when the local priest person would um yeah your book doesn't mention it i mean it mentions the bands from the book of common prayer the local priest or parson would i think in three successive sundays prior to a wedding okay so let's say the wedding is April 28th, on April 21st, April 14th, and April 7th. Beginning then, the parson would stand up and at some point in the surface, service would say, no. Julie and John, John and Julie, however, no. are going to be wed in holy matrimony on 28th April, whatever the year is. If there is anyone who knows that any cause or impediment to this marriage, let him speak now or forever hold his peace. Okay? So that would be done then. Nobody speaks. It's done then. Nobody speaks. It's done then. You don't speak up then. Too late. You, you can't. No Sunday in between. You don't speak up in one of those three Sundays. You cannot admit an impediment. Okay? So, what's an impediment? What's the root word? Impede. What's the root of that? Ped. Foot. Okay? So, what do you do when you impede something? You stop the foot from moving. doesn't mean you chop the foot off. It's you put a barrier. So, let me not, to the marriage of true minds, admit impediments. Well, how do minds have impediments? Impediments talk about walking. Minds don't walk. Or do they? They wander. They can wander. What kind of minds? True. What does true mean? Louder? Faithful. Okay. What else does it mean? <clears throat> not false, right? I mean, if you want to go classical logic, A is not non-A. <laughs> A is A. It's not <laughs> something else. Okay. So, not false. Remember the sonnet about false women's rolling eyes, etc.? Remember sonnet 20? Okay. What else? Louder? Real? Maybe, in one sense. Any of you ride a bike? Any of you ever ride a bike? Okay, here we go. Somebody says, yes. No. What happens to a bicycle tire if someone kicks it really hard? Not on the rubber, on the rim. Bends. It goes what is called out of true. Alignment. Straight. Okay. It's straight. You know, bicycle tire rims made out of what? You got the rim. What's in the middle? The spokes. The hub, which has spokes attaching to it. What's the purpose of the spokes? It's to hold the hub to the rim, right? But the spokes aren't loose. They're all tight. You know what happens if you take a bike? Try it sometime. Get a wrench. 
find a bike locked up somewhere on campus, <laughs> and go to the go to the spokes <clears throat> and start turning them all. You know what'll happen? That tire should look like that. It'll do that. And then what happens? You can't ride it. It's evil. <laughs> because you have the forks that come like this, and you've got a nut there, and the forks are connected here. But if this does this, it rubs against the fork. Why? It's out of true. So let me mock to the marriage of true minds, right? Because there's more than one, right? Notice what they are to each other. Parallel. They're parallel. Okay. Let me not, to the marriage of true minds, admit impediments. So take this image, which you are looking down on the top of, and now extend it. Turn that plane from like this, excuse me, from looking down at it like this to looking down at it this way. What do those do? Parallax, right? Far enough out in the distance, go stand on a train track, no train coming. If it's straight, and look down, and what do you see? Those tracks meet. Okay. These true minds ought to <coughs> meet eventually. Let me, as they what? As they go along in life, so to speak. Okay. So let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Don't let me admit any kind of barrier to the marriage of true minds. What's a marriage? It's a joining, right? Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds. Hmm. Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds. Well, let's finish the sentence, because that's only the ending of a big, long clause. Or bids with the remover to remove. Need another marker. So, love, lover A, and lover B. Love is not love, which alters when an alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Let's say B. I don't think I have a red one in here in here anymore. No, I don't. Let's say B sees C over here. And B's eyes get turned away from A and drawn to C. In other words, let's say B stops loving A and now loves C. All right? So what has B just done? B has removed. B is the remover. All right? Love is not love, which alters when an alteration finds. The alteration is B looking at C. So what is the first love is not love referring to? A. That's A's love for B. See? B's love, sorry, I keep doing this for me. B's love should be directed at A, but B's love has altered. Okay? It's moved over here. Love is not love, which alters when an alteration finds. The alteration is finding B doesn't love me anymore. So, modern world. Most people, I think, I could be wrong, would say A should say what to B? Bye. Bye. <laughs> you know. What's our speaker saying? Love is not love which alters. What does it mean to alter? To change. To stray. To turn. So, what A feels has for B isn't real love if when B turns from A, A says, you, <laughs> later. That's not real love. Oh, yes. Can that line be read of uh, would the 
praying with courtly love tradition? Or, or is that some separate? Like, um, I think Shakespeare was considering that. Some of the sonnets can. I don't think this one can. But do you understand like what I'm saying? Like yeah. the whole like, you know, love doesn't like if you go cheat, they wouldn't say that's cheating, like that doesn't matter. Yes, to some extent. In the theory of courtly love, that's <laughs> how it worked. Okay. okay. There is, you know, there is some debate as to whether courtly love was actually ever really practiced or whether it was entirely a literary construct. Because let's face it, you're married, your wife is your quote unquote lady, she's the hostess of your house, and you've got a bunch of guys working for you. Are you really going to be okay if she's, you know, putting out for them? Probably not. What's probably going to end up to those guys? You know, there's a spot in the garden, and there's a spot in the garden, and there's a spot in the garden, you know. Yeah, they end up dead, right? You know, human jealousy, it's, it's hard to gloss over in literature. Okay? It's, um, it, I kind of don't think it probably was actually real. It was, you know, it was an idea. I don't want to use that. I was going to say it was an ideal, but it wasn't really an ideal. It was an idea that maybe some thought was possible. I don't really think it was practiced, okay? So, it's an, it is an ever-fixed mark. Notice the little accent, because you have to pronounce that final syllable. Ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. Well, where's the tempest in this relationship? It, A's love for B, looks on what? This, what's the tempest? I'm trying not to be sexist. Notice I haven't said who is, who is which gender. I'm not going to, you know. B is the one cheating, right? And A looks on that and notice A's love is never shaken. A's love doesn't waver. It doesn't doubt. It is the star to every wandering bark. What star is that? Because that is an illusion. If you're in the northern hemisphere, Polaris, it's the north star. If you can find Polaris, you can navigate. Especially if you have a sextant, you know, thing that you use to measure the degrees, right? It's the star to every wandering bark. Bark there refers to ship, boat. What else does it refer to? B is doing what? One. Leaving the safe haven. Leaving the port. You're boring. You're dull. It's all the same here. We have no spice in our life. I want something exciting. I want something going off to exciting and new. It's wandering. It's what? It's the star. In other words, you go off, you have your fun. I what? I'll be here. Star to every wandering bark, whose worth's unknown, although its height be taken. That is, we don't know what the worth, the value of the North Star is, but talk about height, it's the degrees. If you can figure out the height, you can figure out where you are. I think it is latitudinally, okay? So, that's the opening eight lines. If this were an Italian sonnet, what would happen after that? You'd have that volta, that turn. But you don't really. Love's not time's fool. Now what is meant by time's fool? Plaything. Toy. Bobble. What happens to a child? child gets a Christmas toy. Or gets a toy for Christmas. What often happens to that toy within a few weeks? Gets chucked. Gets chucked. Gets forgotten. Okay. You want to read a great example of this? If any of you have had, you know, one of our uh, children's lit professors, you know, children's lit course, and you've 
read The Velveteen Rabbit. And if you've never read The Velveteen Rabbit, you are not properly educated. You need to read The Velveteen Rabbit. Because it's about what's real. Okay? So, love's not time's fool. Though, what does although imply? Because it's although, really. But, rosy lips and cheeks within the thin and simple cup of time. Rosy lips and cheeks. That kind of implies. Which kind? Louder. Female. Rosy lips. We don't talk about guys having red lips. I don't. <laughs> Maybe you do. Okay? So this is telling us something. Love not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his. His is time's. Okay? Bending sickles compass come. What's time's bending sickles compass. Well, a compass tells you what? Directions, right? North, east, south, west. It's a circle. <coughs> Times bending sickle, because if you use a sickle to mow hay or grass, you usually have to bend a little bit. <laughs> so, it's the inscription of that sickle okay, in creating a circle. So what happens in that circle? Well, here's my circle of time. And here's somebody else's circle of time. Notice what happens. That is rosy lips and cheeks. That's where B and C meet. Okay? So C is implied to be what? Rosy lips and cheeks, right? C is implied to be female. A, speaker is male. Speaker of the science is male. That's clear. B, probably what? Golden-haired youth. But he's talking about marriage. There is no same-sex marriage in Shakespeare's day. You were killed for being gay. Okay. So he's not talking an erotic marriage. It's a marriage of minds. What did the speaker say in Sonnet 20? Let what? Let love's use be their treasure. Because remember, what did nature do to the thing that she originally created to be a woman? Doting, she pricked thee out for women's pleasure. Okay? So let what? He says, let my love be your mind. So let me not to the true marriage of true minds admit impediments, etc., etc. Love not time's fool, the rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. That is, you're going to meet other people. I can't stop that. Right? Love alters not with his loves. Brief hours in weeks. Wait, is it loves? Or is it times? Do you measure love in terms of hours? <laughs> Unless you're reading the room for the, by the minute, you know, in which case you're probably not talking love. No, that's time. Love's not time's fool, though rosy, excuse me, love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. What's another statement in the traditional English, you know, wedding ceremony? Till death do us part. That's the edge of doom. If this be error, notice big, huge conditional. What hangs on that conditional? 
all 12 lines. So if this is wrong, and upon me proved, that is to me proved, and I think the upon also might mean something else, I never writ, nor no man ever lived. Notice Shakespeare's wily little um, kind of a mini syllogism that he embeds in there. Well, I never writ. Well, we're reading what he writ. So therefore, he did writ. Therefore, not no man ever moved. Therefore, someone has moved before, at least the speaker has. Okay? Now, when I grew up, dinosaur age, but especially where I grew up, California, this poem was used lots of times as wedding vows in the 70s. Think about it for a second. Think about it for a second. What's the speaker saying? Love never what? We've had movies named after the songs, you know, love never dies. Love never changes. If it's what? Love of true minds. Okay. John Milton wrote a booklet, The Doctrine and Discipline of Divorce. Milton's supposed to be this great Puritan, you know, theologian, etc. Paradise Lost and such. And yet he's arguing for divorce. Why? <laughs> he and his wife hated each other. They never divorced, but he wanted to. The church didn't look kindly on it, so they lived apart. Just go away from me. This speaker is saying what? If our minds are true, our love can never alter. It can never change. Yeah, even if C does come in. Okay, so who do you think C is? Because we've already stipulated A is pretty clearly speaker. B, probably golden-haired youth. C. Isn't it like A's mistress or yeah. wife? The dark lady. The slut. She <laughs> just, you know, moves right in. Okay, so what do I mean by that? The dark lady, according to all the sonnets, is Ace mistress, lover, if you need that word. A introduces C to B. Whoops. And whoops. <laughs> and B and C start making little D. <laughs> They start getting busy. And what happens to A? We have a whole bunch of sonnets. <laughs> For example, I just sat in the lowest we started writing. For example, eighty-seven, ninety-three, ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety-seven. 93, 97, 98, 97. How like a winter hath my absence been from thee, the pleasure of the fleeting year. 98, from you, I have been absent in the spring. So, winter, spring, something's happened. These two have been separated. Why? Because these two are probably together. Right? And even if you go back to one of those early ones we read, A applies what about A's relationship with B? There's something improper about it. Not sexually. Status-wise. B, A implies to B, you know, you, 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 you shouldn't be hanging around me. You know, when I get ready to die, which one is that? When I get ready to die, don't, don't sigh because people are going to ask why and then they're going to, you know, they're going to make comments about you. You shouldn't be sighing and moaning over the death of, I mean, come on, the person was beneath you. Again, not romantically. Because even in British society, in Shakespeare's day, upper class, you don't mix with the lower class. I mean, 
PBS, BBC had an entire television series based upon this very notion. Upstairs, downstairs. The upstairs is where the Richies live. The downstairs, who's that? The help. The help. And how do they mix? They don't. Change my bed linens. Okay. Fix my dinner. Polish my shoes. Here, help me get dressed because I'm too you know, rich to pull my shirt on by myself, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Go from there to, well, it's, I mean, we won't talk about it. 127. I said 127 begins the Dark Lady sonnets. In the old age, black was not counted fair. That is, in the old age, long ago, not now, black wasn't beautiful. Now, the speaker is saying, yes, black is beautiful. Why? Her eyes so suited, line 10, and they mourn her seem at such who not born fair, no beauty lack, slandering creation with a false esteem. Yet so they mourn, becoming of their woe, that every tongue says beauty should look so. He's saying, people now look at you and they say, man, I wish I had eyes like yours. Well, her eyes are pitch black. Not the normal color for a pale Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you know, in um, Elizabethan England. Okay, we need to do a couple more and then we'll go on to Johnson and then maybe we'll come back. Oh yeah, let's go ahead and, I think I have this one on. What time is it? 10.15. Number 129, if I didn't have this listed, I should have. The expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action. Such a good song. The expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action. Until action, lust is perjured, murder is bloody, full of blame. Savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust. Notice, he doesn't end the idea there. Normally, Shakespeare will finish an idea either in the middle of a line or definitely the idea finishes at the end of a quatrain. But he's on a roll, right? The speaker is on a roll. Shakespeare, the author, putting this in the speaker's mind. Savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust, enjoyed no sooner, but despised straight, past reason hunted, and no sooner had, past reason hated as a swallowed bait, on purpose laid to make the taker mad. It's still, the sentence isn't over, because that's just a semicolon, but we'll stop there, right? <laughs> Expense of spirit in a waste of shame. What's the expense of spirit? How do you spend your spirit, your soul? Not going to the red, that red light district, you know, hiring a hooker. It's not doing that. Well, might be, I guess. In the Renaissance, it was believed every time you had an orgasm, you died a little bit. A little bit of your spirit died. So you'll see all kinds of poets punning on that. Kill me that I may rise again. Kill me that I can rise again. Kill me that I can rise again. Dunn, John Dunn especially does that. Yeah, and he means rise, you know, phallically, okay? So expense of spirit, the Wasting of spirit, notice. Samuel Johnson said, Shakespeare never met a pun he didn't like. What's another spelling for that? Waste. Think Hamlet. Hamlet's talking to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. They're talking about the goddess fortune. And then they say, we're not on her top. We're not the button on her cap. We're not beneath the soldier's feet. Hamlet says, what? 
about her privates, and they say, Faith, her privates we. Okay? That is, yeah, we're around Faith's privates. And Hamlet says she ever was a strumpet. Fortune was always a whore. She always slept with whatever moved. Or didn't move. Rocks, grass, you know, etc. So, expensive spirit and a waste of shame is lust, what? In action. Because lust that's not in action is where? Up here. It's all thought. It's not doing anything. But once you do it, it notice it's in the waste. Until action, until it's performed, lust is perjured. What's perjury? Lying. It's lying. Because lust up here, it's not real. It's not fully lived out. It's murderous to the self. It's bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust. Enjoyed no sooner, but despised straight. That scene that I think I've referred to probably more than enough times in Hitch, when the one guy's trying to get the one girl in bed, he gets her in bed, he speaks to Will Smith's character, and he says, you know, all this for a lousy life. <laughs> and what does he mean? He did everything. Took her out to dinner, bought her cards, sent her, bought her gifts, etc. Just for the purpose of getting her bed, he gets her in bed, casts her aside. And enjoyed no sooner, but despising straight. Why? Because what does lust promise? Oh, this will be great. Eh, not so much. Past reason hunted. Why is it past reason? Because it's irrational. It goes beyond reason. Not supra-reason. Okay? It's without reason. And no sooner had, that is once the lust is achieved, past reason hated. It's illogical how much one hates what? The other person? This poem is directed inwardly. I shouldn't have done that. That. As a swallowed bait. What do you think the fish realizes? Damn. <laughs> it's just being, you know, tugged by the hook in its mouth. On purpose laid to make the taker mad. Yeah, he's laid there, you know, with its, all of its multifarious meanings. Okay. It does what? It makes the taker, the person who takes action in lust, mad. Mad how? What does mad mean? It doesn't mean angry. Crazy. Okay, crazy how? What is a possible, possible side effect of lust having been achieved in action? Especially back in Shakespeare's day. No. Syphilis. Syphilis. Oh. STDs. <laughs> what do they do? They make you crazy. If syphilis gets to your brain, you're dead. You might not be literally dead yet, but you will be. Okay? So, mad in... Ah, there's part of that crazy idea. You're crazy in pursuit of it and in possession so that in actually achieving it, had, having, and a quest to have, that is future tense, extreme. Anything extreme is what? Unhealthy. It's crazy. It's madness. That's why the Stoics said, you know, moderation and everything. A bliss in proof, that is in the very act of it, improved. The very acting of it, the very world. Why? Because before, it's a joy proposed. And what's always really good about a joy proposed? Not a, I am proposing to you, but an idea that you entertain, that you think will bring great joy. What's the nice thing about that kind of idea? It will always bring you great joy, right? 
your first car, your little kid at Christmas. It's Christmas, a week away. It's always going to bring you joy, right? And then you get to the day and you open up the presents and mom and dad didn't get you what you wanted. Santa's a dirty, rotten bastard. He didn't get you the toy you wanted. And it's a dream. It turned out not to be what you thought it was going to be. Your first car turns out not to be a Maserati. It's a Ford Pinto from 1972, which today would probably go for 50 grand, you know. All this the world well knows. In other words, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. Yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads man to this hell. So is the speaker talking about himself? Or is the speaker addressing friend? Told you. Told you what she'd do. You said, oh, I just have to, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, now look what you get. Okay? Go from there to 130. I'm going to do too many. Because we're going to do 135, too. 130. You should know some of this at least. I'll take that back. You guys are all young. What famous musician ripped off from this poem? Sting, B.A., M.A., English literature, taught English, etc. My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun, title of one of his albums from the early 90s, late 80s, late 80s, really old. Carl, this is an example of an anti-blazon. A blazon is a catalog of beauty. Okay? Typically, Petrarchan English literature, literature modeled after Petrarch's sonnets, a speaker would catalog his beloved's beauty. Her eyes are like so-and-so, her hair is like so-and-so, her skin is like so-and-so, her breasts are like so-and-so, and as you'll see with another poem, you know, and everything else, man, it's like a gold mine. It's just wealthier than wealth. Okay, so this is the opposite of that. Okay, so he's going to take the standard tropes of beauty and reverse them, turn them upside down. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. So why would you say your your mistress's eyes are like the sun? What happens if you look at the sun? You're blinded. See, that's what should happen when you look in your girlfriend or boyfriend's eyes blinded by the light you know there's a song that has those lines coral is far more red than her lips red okay. coral where is coral red louder say it you were right under the water in the ocean okay what would Shakespeare's experience of coral have been? <coughs> He's read about it. Has he ever been? Where, where do you find coral? Under the water, obviously. Where? Ocean. Where? Which ocean? North Sea? No. Irish Sea? No. no. Baltic? No. Tropics, for the most part. For the most part, not entirely. Okay. How far are the tropics from England? Yeah, it's a ways. So in order for coral to be red, when Shakespeare would have seen it, it would have to been plucked alive and kept alive in seawater. Doesn't happen. How many of you have ever seen coral outside the ocean? I should bring in show and tell. I've got some at home. What happens to it? It dies. And? It fades. You can have the deepest, reddest coral, and within a couple of years, what does it look like? Bone. Bone. White. Coral is far more red than her lips red. Her lips aren't red, folks. If snow be white, 
right? Because snow is white. Why then her breasts are done. What's done? Think dirty dishwater. Dirty laundry water. Yeah, ew. What's he talking about? The complexion of her skin. She's dark skin. Okay? If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. So she's got kinky like hair. She doesn't have long golden tresses like is the model of beauty at the time. Or maybe long red tresses like Queen Elizabeth. Because Queen Elizabeth was taken to be the model of beauty. Which is why, even in your book, the pictures you have of her, her skin is like this white. Okay? I can hold this up to every person in this room, and none of you has skin this white. Why? It ain't natural. <laughs> so how did she get skin that white? Powdered. 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 And she's also never shown with her mouth open. Why? Her teeth were black. She liked sugar. Literally, she liked sugar, and her, her teeth were rotten. Okay? So... I have seen roses damask, that is, multicolored. Red and pink and white, etc. Red and white. But no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight, my favorite line from all of Shakespeare, than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. Okay, so if you're ever out on a date, and the person you're out on the date with says, Oh, man. You really reek tonight. What's going to happen? Probably end of the day. <laughs> Probably end of the day. If you're lucky and it's not the end of your life. Okay? And nothing good's going to happen. I love to hear her speak. Yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. So she doesn't have a melodious voice. And I always like to think of Fran Drescher. Anybody know who that is? Yeah. The nanny. Yeah. Right? yeah, she thinks sometimes. She's like Madame Eglantine, okay, in Chaucer, who sings the divine office through her nose. She intones it like this, okay. I grant I never saw a goddess go. Go there meaning walk. Oh, so, big deal. Why does he say that? Because in the sonnet tradition, the poet or the speaker of the sonnets describes his beloved as a goddess. She's always up there with Aphrodite and Venus and such. Okay? I never saw a goddess walk. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And the way that's often understood is the speaker is saying two things. One, she's real. My mistress is real. All these other guys who are writing sonnets, like, for example, Sir Philip Sidney, writes a sequence called Astrophil and Stella. Stella means what? Star. Astrophil. Astro, like astronomy. Star, Phil, lover. Star, lover, star. She's a goddess, okay? He says, mine, she's not a goddess, she's real. Another possible suggestion by the fact that she walks on the ground, she's a streetwalker. She's a hooker. So he gets her most of the time, but, you know, other times, yeah, she's not paying customers. And yet, by heaven, that's an oath. I think my love as rare. Is any she be lied with false compare? My love probably refers to the woman, the beloved. It could also mean my love for her is as rare as any of these false goddesses. So why does he take this and turn it on its head? Because the speaker is saying, mine's real. They compare theirs to their eyes are like sunlight. Yeah, well, nobody's eyes really blind. They compare their 
breast to being like the whitest note. Yeah, well, nobody's that white. So he's just going to take that all those image images and completely reverse them. Okay? People, by the way, have done all kinds of research to try to find out who the dark lady is. And some have suggested, you know, there's even a writer in your book, Amelia Lanyard, who, if I remember correctly, was dark skinned. And some say she was she was the lover. And that Shakespeare is the actual speaker. I have no idea. Well, there's, there's not a lot of evidence to necessarily suggest that. Okay, 135, last one by Shakespeare. One of his dirtiest ones. If you have the key to understand the dirt. <laughs> Which I will give you. Yes. And it's a play on words. Right? 135. Notice. Footnote 3. In Shakespeare's time, the word will could also refer to sexual desire and even to the genitals. So it refers to Will Shakespeare. Possibly. <clears throat> it re refers to volition, just regular old will, I will do this. It refers to sexual volition. And it refers to possible genitalia. Okay. Whoever hath her wish. Your gloss tells you, no matter what other women may wish for or attain, thou hast thy will. Okay, so what's thy will? Well, notice there it's capitalized. Usually when something's capitalized, we either assume it to be personified or the name of a person. So, no matter what they get, you have me, possibly. It could also, you know, frankly, it could be any one of these as well. And will to boot and will an overplus. Overplus, superabundance. Will to boot, that is, in addition, more than enough am I that vex thee still. More than enough am I. More than enough what? Will. I am. I am Will Shakespeare. After all, I am. More will desire than you want, more sexual desire, and I'm obviously able to satisfy you this way too. Okay? So, to thy sweet will, making addition thus, wilt thou, notice past tense will, wilt thou, whose will is large and spacious, and there is also a Renaissance notion women can never be sexually, sexually satisfied. I mean, just leave the door open and let the men just keep coming in, you know, turnstile style. <laughs> Why? Because men, you know, can't die, rise, die, rise, die, you know, repeatedly. Got to recharge after a while. Women, uh-uh. Just keep them coming. You see that in a lot of poets. So, wilt thou whose will is large and spacious not once vouchsafe to hide my will in thine? Yeah, probably number four there. <laughs> Could be number three, but, you know, I don't think it's number one. Shall will in others seem right great, gracious, and in my will no fair except in shine? That is, you slept with him. Why not me? I mean, what's so wrong about me? And in uh, the sea, so he, okay, let's, let's use an image. Let's, let's not get too dirty. The sea, all water, yet receives rain still. And in abundance addeth to his store. So thou, that is, you are like the sea, being rich in will, because your will is so rich, so abundant, add to thy will one will of mine to make thy large will more. That is, I will be like the rain. I will just, I will fall on you. And I will make you more. Let no unkind. Your gloss tells you unkindness. It could also be unnaturalness. No fair beseechers kill. Think all but one. And me and that one will. 
Now, what's that very last line mean? Oh, yeah. Sorry, your gloss tells you. Wish they hadn't. It says, think of all your suitors as one. But then what does the last half line mean? Once you have my will, what, any of these, once you sleep with me, the speaker is implying you won't need to sleep with anyone else. All men are subsumed, are met in me. Now, speaker has an ego, right? I mean, speaker's kind of saying, hey, baby, you won't want Fred, George, Tom, Will, 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 after you've met Will, <laughs> or Will, one of those two, okay? All right, we'll stop with Shakespeare and go to Ben Johnson, just simply because we don't have time to do more. I, I, I've got an entire course on the books, just Shakespeare sonnets, but I'll never get a teacher <laughs> because it won't get enough students. Okay, so there's Ben Johnson. Johnson's a contemporary of Shakespeare. He's also a contemporary of John Donne, who we'll do right after Johnson. And we don't have a lot of time to do as much of Dunn, uh, Johnson as I'd like. Let's see what time? 10 40, 25 minutes? Yeah, we can do all these. But I do want to do these two short poems on my first daughter, on my first son, and then his epitaph to Shakespeare. Okay? So, let's get rid of this. And I can't turn you off because you won't work, will you? Nope. Um, so, on my first daughter. Here lies to each her parents' Ruth, Mary, the daughter of their youth. Yet all heaven's gifts being heaven's due, it makes the father less to rue. What does it mean to rue? Regret. To regret? To be sorry for. At six months in, she parted hence with safety of her innocence. She died when she was six months old. His first daughter died when she was six months old. His first son died when he was seven years old. Sucks to be Ben Johnson, you know. Can't imagine. So she dies with safety of her innocence. Whose soul, heaven's queen whose name she bears, in comfort of her mother's tears, have placed amongst her virgin train. In heaven, Mary, queen of heaven, has placed little Mary among her followers. This gray partakes the fleshly birth. Excuse me. Where, while that severed, doth remain, this gray partakes the fleshly birth. Okay? Which cover lightly gentle earth. So it's an elegy. It's obviously a lament, right? It's a lament over something lost, his daughter. Okay? And yet it's not, it's not bitter. It's not full of egregious sorrow. There is sorrow. And yet the speaker says what? And the speaker is clearly Ben Johnson. Okay? Speaker says what? It's okay. Why? She's in heaven. She's with Mary. And Jesus and the others, okay? All heaven's gifts being heaven's due. Well, there's an idea from the wanderer. Here, life is fleeting. Here, wealth is fleeting. Here, friend is fleeting. Here, da 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 da, -da. What's that word for fleeting? Loaned. And if it's loaned, you got to pay it back. So, all heaven's gifts being heaven's due, it makes the Father less to rue. According to Psalms, children are a gift. If they're a gift, if they're loaned, they got to be paid back at some point. Usually, we hope, after we're dead. You know, parents aren't supposed to bury, bury their children. It's supposed to be the other way around. Okay? Now look at on my first son. Farewell, thou child of my right hand. Well, that's what the name Benjamin means. Child of my right hand. Why not child of my left hand? It's the devil. It's the sinister one. Child of my right hand. 
when the Old Testament speaks about God, it speaks about God's power, and God does something, he does it with his right hand. So it's the hand of power, authority, majesty, etc., etc. Farewell, thou child of my right hand, and joy. My sin was too much hope of thee, loved boy. How can a parent have too much hope of a child? What does every parent want for their children? The best. The best? A better life than we had? Yes. What else can parents do, though? Why? Because they want their life to be better. And okay. Why else? <clears throat> what do some parents try to do through their children? Live vicariously. <clears throat> Live vicariously. My wife and I, we all, I'm not kidding, we almost either called off our wedding or eloped the night before. Why? Because we had the rehearsal. <laughs> Family. I won't go any more than that. <laughs> Family. And it's like, or you better put the collar on and bring her in. <laughs> you know? Okay. I won't say any more. So, seven years thou wert lent to me, and I thee pay. I got to give you back. Exacted by thy fate on the just day. What does just there mean? The right. The proper, the appointed. I don't know about you, but if I had to bury my seven-year-old son, I've got two sons, probably in the act of burying, I wouldn't be going, oh, this is right and proper. He was only supposed to live seven years. Uh-uh. No. Jo parents don't do that. <laughs> oh, could I lose all father now? Now, I could be wrong, but I think... Johnson is saying, it would be better if I had never had you than to feel this pain. Why do I think that? For why will man lament the state he should envy? What's the state? It's two, and they're very, very different. The state of fatherhood, why should you lament that? He's saying every man should want to be a father. What's the other state? The state where his child is now. Well, where is his child, he thinks? Heaven. Why should you lament your child being in heaven? I mean, if you thought your child was a dirty, rotten bastard, evil child murderer in the making, etc., etc., and was going to hell, yeah, you might lament that. Okay? A little facetiousness there. You would lament that, obviously. Okay? So what's the state he should envy? To have so soon escaped, escaped, worlds and fleshes rage, and if no other misery, yet age. Almost like a little encapsulation of Hrothgar's entire homily. Because what's going to happen to you eventually, Beowulf? You're going to die. Either old age will come, or fire, or sword, or famine, or flood, or sword, or spear, or old age. Notice, you know, sword, spear, old age. They kind of, you know, repeat. I think this is Johnson going, God, you should have taken me. Why? Because I'm the one who's suffering worlds and flesh's rage. And age. Rest in soft peace and ask, say, here doth lie Ben Johnson his best piece of poetry. Poet, I have to make it rhyme. Poetry. What is poetry? What do we think it is? Art. Louder? Art. Art? What else? What kind of art? Literary. Literary. Keep going. It's not Lord of the Rings. It's not Dickens. Dickens didn't, I don't think, ever write poetry. If he did, it'd be so long you'd never finish it. Right? It's literary art made of words, usually with some kind of rhyme, some kind of meter, maybe not always rhyme. Definitely has meter. As William Faulkner said, the poet is the person who says the most with the least. That's why he's a novelist. 
His words, not mine. Faulkner said, I write novels because I'm not a poet. The poet says the absolute most with the absolute fewest words. The novelist might say some with a lot of words, you know, depending upon the novelist. What's Johnson's best piece of poetry? Is it this poem? It's his son. Because a poem literally... <laughs> we just accept the convention it's something made out of words with a meter to it and an accent and maybe rhyme, etc. He's saying, best thing I ever made right here. For whose sake? For your sake. Dead Benjamin. All his vows, whose vows? The father's mine, be such as what he loves may never like too much. Why the as what he loves may never like too much? <coughs> he introduces an idea that we're going to pick up if we do it in a poem by Dunn. And it's this idea that runs throughout quote unquote Christian history. You better not put anything before God. Why? God's going to take it away from you. Why? He's a jealous God. First commandment. No, no other gods before me. He doesn't, that doesn't mean just gods. What else can it mean? Gods. 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 Drink. Gods. Smoke. God. Anything can become a god. How so? It becomes more important than that god. I think Johnson is saying, okay, I get your point. No other god before you. We're going to see Dunn do something very, very similar, if we can get to that point. Okay, now let's look at 14 minutes. Not pincers. To the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, and what he hath left us. This poem is at the beginning of the first folio of Shakespeare's plays, published in 1623 by Shakespeare's playwright um, colleagues, uh, excuse me, acting colleagues, Hemings Condell and some of the other guys in the Globe Company, the Kingsmen, all right? Not all of them, because a couple of them have died by 1623. Published 1623. Shakespeare dies what year? 1616. What day? It's our last day of class. April 23rd, okay? So, 4, 23, 1660. He was born 4, 23, 1564. <coughs> Notice... He died. Right? So, a lot of people ask, because somebody in here brought up the anonymous kind of stuff uh, a week or so ago. A lot of people suggest, well, that's seven years after he died. Why does it take him seven years to publish a collected edition of his plays? And the group of people... They're not a group in the sense that, you know, they have meetings and such. The anti-Stratfordians, that is, the people who say Shakespeare or Stratford on Avon wasn't Shakespeare, um, they generally say, as one of their pieces of evidence that the guy from Stratford wasn't Shakespeare, is this. That nobody says anything when Shakespeare dies. Literally, apparently. There are no poems published immediately after his death. We've got all kinds of poems published about much, 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 you get the idea, more minor poets than Shakespeare immediately after death. In fact, we not only have poems, we have books of poems published about that no-name poet. And nothing, nothing for seven years. Ah, he must not have been the real Shakespeare. 
somebody else must have been the real, the real Shakespeare, and the guys form a conspiracy to build up the real Shakespeare. It doesn't mean the real Shakespeare, Stratford-on-Avon, wasn't involved with the king's man, the globe. We know he was. Okay? But the centrality of the argument is that guy couldn't have written the plays. Anybody know why? Bingo. He didn't go to university. He didn't have an English degree. How could he write the plays that he wrote? How could this guy from Woodbury, essentially, because that's what Stratford-on-Avon would be to London, what Woodbury would be to Washington, D.C., or New York. How could this guy from Woodbury write these plays, these sonnets, these four major poems? It's impossible. Had to have a university degree. Okay? So, Johnson writes this. Bear in mind, Johnson is a contemporary of Shakespeare's and a competitor. Johnson's also writing plays. Okay? Not as good, but you know, still he's writing plays. To the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, and what he hath left us. So, Johnson's going to begin with a series of lines from 1 through 16, actually, um, 1 through the first part of 17. And the 1 through the first part of line 17 are essentially like a prologue or a preface. They're not his main point. Okay? So, to draw no envy, Shakespeare, on thy name, am I thus ample to thy book and fame. Thy book, the first folio, which has a big picture of Shakespeare in the opening. I'll, um, I'll remember and I'll bring in a facsimile of it on Tuesday. Sorry. What day is today? Thursday. Today's Thursday. Yeah, Tuesday. Okay? While I confess thy writings to be such as neither man nor muse can praise too much. That is, we don't have words to praise you. Even the muses can't praise you too much. That's saying a lot. Because the muses do what? They inspire people to praise. So if the muses can't inspire the praise, but these way, he, scratch that. That's not what I meant to say. Because <laughs> that's essentially what these ways were not the paths I meant to thy praise. Why? Silliest ignorance on these may light. Which, when it sounds at best, but echoes right. Silliest ignorance. Foolish ignorance, that is, could say what I've just said. And because I'm not a fool nor ignorant, I don't want to say that. Or blind affection which doth near advance the truth, but gropes and urges all by chance. Blind affection. If any of you are in a Shakespeare class or have had a Shakespeare class, or take my Shakespeare intro to Shakespeare course in the fall, you might find yourself at some point with a group of people and you talk about, you know, taking Shakespeare. And somebody go, oh man, I love Shakespeare. And you start asking them questions and you immediately find out what? They don't love Shakespeare. Dumb or a rock. They don't know anything about Shakespeare. Oh, I love Shakespeare. A drink? What do they mean? Okay. Or crafty malice might pretend this praise and think to ruin where it seemed to raise. That is, somebody who really doesn't like you might try to tear you down. See, our first reference to Shakespeare is in 1592. A guy named Robert Greene. By the way, he wrote a story called Pandasto, which Shakespeare steals from for one of his plays. Which play? Twelfth Night, I think. Okay. Robert Greene writes this pamphlet called A Groat's Worth of Wit and a Million of Repentance. A groat's worth is like a penny's worth. So a penny's worth of wit, not worth much, and a million pennies of repentance. And he makes reference in there to an upstart crow who can shake a lance, Shakespeare, okay, and who beautifies himself with feathers on a tiger's hide. And he quotes a passage from one of the King John uh, 
Henry VI plays. Quotes an actual passage. Everybody takes that to mean Green's talking about Shakespeare. And what it shows is that in 1592, Shakespeare's already made it. This guy's jealous of that. Okay? So, back to Johnson. Crafty malice might pretend this praise and think to ruin where it seemed to raise. These are as some infamous bod or whore should praise a matron. A matron. A noble, well thought of, moral woman. Okay. What could hurt her more? He says, but thou art proof against them. The thou, I think that means the book. Your book is proof. So, he says, and it's above the ill fortune of them or the need. I therefore will begin. Then scratch everything I just said. Soul of the age. What do you mean, soul of the age? Well, if you watched background lecture to the Middle Ages, where I talk about the Ptolemaic system, of the universe that has what you got the nine <coughs> spheres right and each sphere has what it has a ruling intelligence well that idea gets extrapolated because the sphere not may not be a sphere it might be a time period what do we call the time period that Shakespeare lived in the Elizabethan period why Elizabeth is the soul of the age so to speak and we call the theater Shakespearean. Why? Shakespeare is the soul of the theater of the time. So Johnson says, you are the soul of the age that we live in. The applause, delight, wonder of our stage. And he still is. Go to London during the summer. And I bet if you did a tallying, and you were to count the number of plays performed by authors, you would find far more plays by Shakespeare than by any other playwright. You'll probably find one or two by Ben Johnson. You might find some, you know, more modern playwrights. But you're going to have probably five different productions of Just a Midsummer Night's Dream in London. And then a bunch of others. Okay? So, delight. Applause, delight, wonder of our stage. My Shakespeare rise. This is kind of like Lazarus coming forward. Anyway, come on, Shakespeare, get up. I will not lodge thee by Chaucer or Spencer or bid Beaumont lie a little farther, further to make thee room. He's talking about Poets' Corner in Westminster <coughs> Abbey. He's not going to go in to Poets' Corner and go, Chaucer, move over there. Beaumont, Fletcher, come on. we got to make room for Shakespeare. Why? Thou art a monument without a tomb. You don't need a tomb. Why else? He's got a tomb. It's in Stratford-on-Avon. It's at the Trinity Church. You go in there and there's a monument with a pretty poor image of Shakespeare, like made out of bad plaster by a kindergartner. The face is kind of... Okay? And it's got words underneath it that says, essentially, don't disturb this tomb. He who, you know, disturbs these bones, I mean, it's a curse, essentially. We're not going to finish Johnson's thing, obviously, so we'll get close. Actually, we won't get close. So, and art alive still while thy book doth live. Well, remember what he said in Sonnet 18? As long as men have breath and eyes to see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. The book gives life to Shakespeare. Art alive while thy book doth live, and we have wit to read and praise to give. What did he mean by wits? I ask this because it used to be pretty much the case. Every department of English at every college in the United States, 50 years ago, 
In order to graduate with a degree in English, you read Shakespeare. You had to have a course in Shakespeare, usually two. Now, the vast majority of English departments do not require you to read any Shakespeare at all. You're not required to have an intro to Shakespeare, Shakespeare's tragedy, Shakespeare's histories. No, you do what? You take a selection of courses from this time period. Okay? What's he saying about wits? As long as people are smart enough to know to read you, then they will what? Then they'll have praise to give. But if they're not smart enough to even crack open your book to begin with, then it's not going to happen. Okay, we'll stop there because I've got just about a minute before. Let me put this here. Actually, I need to bring my other book next week. <clears throat>